Amen. Okay, um, and you can all say also a prayer that my voice holds out. I've had bronchitis for three weeks, so that's been fun. Um, <clears throat> it was over 10 years ago, uh, actually at Women in the Word, that I developed a love for the minor prophets. But I find for many, this is an obscure and often avoided corner of scripture. These books may seem distant and confusing at first glance. Can we find Jesus in the Minor Prophets? He isn't always very obvious. Twisting scripture until every single thing is always about Jesus is a bad approach to studying the word. However, allow me to ask the opposite question. If we aren't looking for Jesus, what are we looking for? Often we're looking to see ourselves. When we do this, we cast ourselves in the role of the hero of the stories. Generally, we aren't that heroic. <laughs> Jesus is the hero. Many times we come to scripture looking for something to do or something to accomplish. This becomes a way to earn God's favor by doing something good. But Jesus is the only one who is fully good, keeping the whole law perfectly. Well, what if we come to scripture to find an, an, an example to emulate or a lifestyle that is pleasing to the Lord? Isn't that okay? This boils down to looking for morals to keep and forces us onto the never ending cycle of do more, be better. While it's important to strive to continually to become more Christ-like in our characters, we can never hold being good enough or doing enough as the goal. Only Jesus is righteous. This is why we come to scripture to find Jesus. And why we can find Jesus in all of scripture. Because he answers all the longings in all the stories where everything goes horribly awry. And he is the ultimate exaltation in all the stories where anything goes right in any way. Twice in Philippians, Paul says that his goal in life is to know Christ above all things. In Ephesians, Paul's prayer for the saints says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Paul's primary exhortation to the saints is to know Christ. Other New Testament authors have this goal as well. John says he wrote his gospel so that you may believe. Luke says that he gathered together his gospel to make an orderly account for Theophilus, the lover of God. We also hear this goal to know God in the Old Testament. The New Living Translation gives Hosea 6 as, Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. Habakkuk says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And just FYI, both those authors, minor prophets. Human beings were made to be in relationship with God. We look for Jesus in all of scripture so we can know him. Because Jesus is the exact representation of God, according to the author of Hebrews. But if scripture is written primarily so that we can know God, why is this so confusing? Why doesn't it just come out and describe him and get it over with? I understand the sentiment. But how interesting is a list of character traits? I would read it and forget most of it. The Bible is written so that we have to mull it over, to think about it. Tim Mackey at the Bible Project likes to call it Jewish meditation literature. And in this way, if we take it in and ponder it, we begin to form a picture of who God is on his own terms. God uses stories so that we understand on a personal level who he is because we're just normal people. Also keep in mind that while we read the Bible as a book, for many, many generations, the Bible was in the form of a series of scrolls. These were not something that people owned multiple copies of, but extremely rare and reverently cared for in the temple and later in the synagogues. Without owning their own texts, people heard the word read to them, listening to scripture, 
is a very different experience from reading it. Scripture is designed to be read aloud. It has stories and poetry and songs and letters and prophecy and contracts and a bunch of other genres. Frankly, it's amazing literature. And it uses metaphor and themes and symbolism and archetype and repetition and all kinds of other literary devices. Any demand that you might place on a great piece of literature, you can place on the Bible. It will blow your categories, I promise you. Now let's talk about the prophets. The prophets are the people who stand in the role of speaking the words of God. They speak in real time to real people in a real culture. Most of the things they have to say are for that time. Yes, they also have things to say about the future, but the vast majority of their words are for the people who are standing right there in front of them. They're not like the priests who were all from the tribe of Levi, but rather prophets come from all over the nation of Israel. How do they know what to say? Well, that's a harder question to answer. Some prophets have visions that they write down for us, like in Isaiah 6, or Daniel does for large chunks of his book. Some of these are images they describe. Some are dreams, some are visions that the prophets seem to have while they're awake, and others are words they just seem to have. I don't know if there's much of a difference or if it would even matter. When you find a section in one of the prophets that is particularly confusing, ask yourself why. Are there contextual clues that might help you understand it, or the reasons that it's difficult? It might be that the prophet is coming up against the edge of the capabilities of human language. Is he explaining something that he sees in a vision of the heavenly realm? How could one even put words to that? Is the prophet describing a future that is a possible outcome, but not assured? Is the prophet interpreting something that God has already done, but reframing it so the people understand it properly? Overall, much of what is recorded in the books of the prophets are things that start out with words like the opening of Jeremiah, which says, the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the 11th year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile, the word of the Lord came to me, saying... You got that? There are a couple of hallmarks that are worth noting here. First, notice that the prophet gives a bit of his lineage. These were real people, identifiable in their time. And Jeremiah happens to also be a priest. Most prophets were not. Second, time was kept based on the reign of kings. And so the prophets told which kings were in place during the time they were active. And last, the words that the prophets spoke are often referred to as words of the Lord. Prophets were never to use their own words or to speak their own thoughts, but only to speak words they had received from the Lord. Okay, who are the prophets? If we think about what I just said, that the prophet is the one who speaks the word of God to the people, then we see that Moses is the one who most clearly sets up this pattern. He has the largest role in speaking for God to the people. All through the nation's history, there are prophets. So we have people like Deborah in the time of the judges, and Nathan in the early monarchy. Then there's Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah and Jeremiah, and by this time you're getting right up into the time of the exile. During the exile, you have prophets like Daniel and Ezekiel, and after you get Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, I have skipped many prophets Notice that not all of them have their own books. So having a book named after you doesn't mean much. Think of Elijah, who appears with Moses and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He doesn't have his own book, but Obadiah does. Zeroing in on the minor prophets a little more, there are 12 of them. And they are all writing during the monarchy, well after the division of the nation into two kingdoms after the death of Solomon. 
The dates are roughly 800 to 460 BC, depending on where you place a few books like Joel, which are hard to pin down. Nearly half are written while Israel and Judah are competing for dominance. Some deal with the years directly preceding the exile, and a couple are concerned with reestablishing the people in the land after the exile, and a handful are directed toward other nations. Hearing the context in which these prophets were writing might cause one to wonder why they're considered minor at all. They're only minor because all 12 of them could fit on one scroll. They're only minor because <clears throat> they're short. It has nothing to do with their importance. Also, it would be presumptuous of us to say of any prophet that these are the only words God ever asked them to say to the people. They're all that we have written down. Mm -hmm. Could he have asked them to say things that weren't recorded? In other words, could God have asked them to say things to the people that then he did not record for us to know? I imagine God has said many things to many people over many years that he has not recorded for me. And just what do these prophets have to say in general? If we go back and remind ourselves that Moses was the model prophet, we should probably expect to hear something that sounds similar to what Moses had to say. And in fact, we do. Moses makes a great summary for himself and indeed most of the prophets in Deuteronomy. At the end of this book, Moses lays before Israel a choice. He says, you can follow the Lord or not. Following the Lord will come with great blessings and abandoning him will result in great curses. I think people tend to read those blessings as if they are possible, but the curses as if they are hyperbole. Moses and the prophets remind us that God is serious. They say, repent, believe. Much of what the prophets have to say boils down to this. People are no different now than they were then. We always need to hear these words. Maybe the nuance is different. The cultural setting is different. But the underlying condition of a heart that is turned toward its own exaltation is the same. The resulting destruction of humanity is the same. And the cure is the same. Repent. Come to God. He has made a way. Okay. Let's talk about how we find Jesus in the Minor Prophets. It's important not to take any portion of Scripture out of its context. When we do that, we are much more likely to interpret Scripture poorly and do things like revert to seeing ourselves as a hero, find morals to achieve, etc. Just knowing this is a common problem is half the battle. So here are some important things to keep in mind. The first audience was a live audience. What context did they need? They lived it. This was not history. It was their day to day. Most of what the prophets talked about happened in real time to real people. That means that the authors assume you understand their context because they were dealing with practical, tangible events. But we are reading it a long time after it was written down, even longer after it was spoken. We don't have the proper day-to-day -day understanding. Most of the prophets aren't written in narrative or story form, and so don't give you much background. For an, Israel of the, an, <clears throat> excuse me, for an Israelite of the time, knowing who the king was would have been enough, not for us. For example, when Hosea, the first of the minor prophets in our English Bibles, opens with the words, the word of the Lord, which came to Hosea, the son of Beri, during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, and during the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Do you know what this means? I bet most of us are left scrambling. That's a whole lot of names that I kind of know, but really don't. And I'm left thinking, shoot, now I have to go find out about them before I can even read this book. There are two ways you can go from here, and truthfully, either one is okay. You can just read Hosea. You should be careful about your interpretations, realizing that there's background you could know, but you don't. But even so, you will learn a lot about God. 
spoiler, he's really awesome in Hosea <laughs> and does some unexpected things. Or you could take the extra step of finding out about the history into which Hosea was speaking. Go read up on those kings, which admittedly might make you feel like you're entering a warren of rabbit trails that you are never going to find the end of or be able to make sense of, and maybe you ought to just give up on it. But don't put the Bible back on your shelf and walk away just yet. What if you approach it as if this is a story? God's story. When you're tracking down those kings and the history piece, you are discovering another aspect of the same story. You will realize that learning about those kings is only a few chapters, actually. And you can read that in a day. And then come back to Hosea. As you do this every so often, you continue to add to what you know of the story. And eventually you won't have to go track it all down all the time. You'll hold more of the story in your head. As a matter of fact, about those kings, here's a tip to get you started. If the prophet is talking about a king from the northern nation of Israel, you can just assume the king was bad and did not honor God. If the prophet is talking about Judah in the south, it's a little more complicated. But the real standouts are Hezekiah and his great-grandson, Josiah. They are generally good kings. A few others are okay, but not many. Most are pretty bad. Manasseh, notably Hezekiah's own son, is pretty much the worst. If you can hold that much in your head to get started, you are well on your way. Using Hosea's opening as our example, what we would have done would be to go back to the historical books, maybe first or second kings, and find the names of the kings that Hosea lists. Honestly, I'd look it up on Google if your Bible doesn't cross-reference it for you already and read through the chapters where they show up. You can make it more complicated. You can read the other prophets that mention them. You can read where they show up in Chronicles, but you don't have to. So you can get a little of the history or a lot of it. But there's another important aspect to the history that we need to talk about. Redemptive history. Let's define that term. I said earlier that this is God's story. And an easy way to remember this is the very word history. I know this is corny, but it works. If you divide it in half and double the S, you get his story. And that is what this is in a way. Redemptive history assumes that time itself has a goal. Redemption. That God is working all things together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That he is righting the wrongs. That one day we will see clearly that which we now see only as a dim reflection. That he will restore all things and make all things new. And that in Christ we are a new creation. One body. That the end of Revelation is true and that Christ has yet to return. This is the light in which we read the prophets, and in fact, all of Scripture, through the lens of redemption. On the grandest scale, in the largest terms, God is always doing this. More than that, though, I have found that for me, I am always aware of one more piece of the puzzle when I'm studying the prophets, and that is the Book of Lamentations, which was written, many scholars say, by Jeremiah. The book doesn't officially claim an author, an author, but Jeremiah discusses many similar events, so he seems like an obvious first choice. Many people call Jeremiah the weeping prophet. He lived during hard and sad times. There is one famous quote from Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. These verses are almost dead center of the book and are almost the only words of comfort or hope. The book is full of horror. It is a trauma to read because when you read it, knowing it is scripture, you know it is true. Moses told the people at the end of Deuteronomy what will happen when they turn away from the Lord. And he tells them that they will indeed 
turn away. It is an awful thing. Terrible things, Moses describes. Lamentations proves they are not hyperbole. It is the record of the lived experience of the worst thing that an Israelite could conceive of. It is written during and about the siege and fall of Jerusalem, which took years. So much death and misery. I don't want to describe it here because, to be honest, I would need to give trigger warnings in today's setting. But know this, lamentations can be soul-crushing. There are good reasons why Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. So why does this frame the prophets for me? An Israelite could not really conceive of the fall of Jerusalem. It was built on a hill that was naturally well defended. After God had enabled Israel to capture it, Jerusalem had never fallen to an enemy, ever. Not even to the Assyrians, and boy howdy, they tried to capture it. The Assyrians destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and were working on defeating Judah when they came to Jerusalem. They were literally at the wall, taunting them. God miraculously rescued Jerusalem. Judah was confident that God would do it again. But when Babylon came, God did not. He allowed his holy city, the place where his spirit dwelt, to be destroyed. Not only that, they captured and exiled his people. They destroyed his temple. It was a total mind warp for an Israelite to know that Jerusalem could fall, that it did fall. The temple of the Lord was torn down stone from stone. When I read a prophet, one of the first things I want to know is the timeline in relation to lamentations. How many generations are yet to come before the nation experiences the events recorded in lamentations? We cannot underestimate how much of a paradigm shift the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple would have been. Many people look to a text's relationship to the exile, which lamentation starts, but I think that glosses over the importance of this event. Now that we have some framing on the prophets in general, and the minor prophets in particular, let's start to get our bearings in Zephaniah. I know you have the text in your um, booklet, but um, I'm a big fan of also seeing text in the Bible, so if you want to bounce back and forth, feel free. So open your Bibles to Zephaniah. It's a tiny little book, three chapters, 53 whole verses. It's before Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, and if you get to Matthew, you've gone 500 years too far. <laughs> These texts are um, also in your booklet, as you've noticed. Um, okay, skim verse one. He says he's working during the reign of Josiah, a good king. Notice that he only mentions the reign of the king in Judah. That's because the northern kingdom is already taken away by Assyria. We mentioned Josiah just a minute ago. He's famous for instituting temple reforms after the priests find the law, and yes, that means it had been lost twice, actually. He was made king as a boy because his father was assassinated, and uh, it's a mess. His grandfather, though, was Manasseh, who, as we now know, was just about the worst king Judah ever had. He was known to have sacrificed his children to false gods, and he caused the people to sin worse than the Canaanite nations the Lord had driven out before them, according to 2 Kings 21. So Judah is a wreck when Josiah comes in as a child. And this is when we hear from the Lord through Zephaniah. And what does Zephaniah have to say? Verse 2, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. Oh dear, now that can't be good. This is a whole new level of bad. Shall we continue? The next four verses, I will sweep away both man and beast. 
I will sweep away the birds in the sky, and the fish in sea, and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble when I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship in this place, the very names of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord, who also swear by Molech, those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. Zephaniah and so the Lord is going on almost decreating in his opening accusation against Judah. God calls them out for the rampant idolatry that treats Yahweh as if the one true God were just a God among many. The problem with this is that all those other gods are made in our own image. Flipping the narrative, instead of our being image bearers of God, idols are whatever we make them out to be. Along with idolatry came child sacrifice, which while horrifying to us as modern readers was not a super uncommon religious practice. For an Israelite to practice it was a great abomination as the murder of an image bearer of God. And so Jerusalem has a pronouncement of judgment made against her. And it is very bad, and it is coming very fast. In fact, we know from history that it is within a generation that destruction falls. So it is very near. As Zephaniah continues, God goes all around, naming the nations nearby. And he says they too will be judged spiraling closer and closer to Judah and Jerusalem. And finally, he promises to destroy Jerusalem. When you get to chapter three, it opens by saying, woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. And that is Jerusalem. God says he has done everything to get her attention, to bring her back. He has blessed her but she has found other gods. He has disciplined her and she has not returned to him in repentance. And now there's nothing for it but to destroy her. Oh, it is doom and gloom all over the place. What a mess. God just said in no uncertain terms that he is going to destroy everything. And as I read this, I think God is right. They deserve destruction. Look at how awful they are, sacrificing their children, abandoning the one true God for these idols that they've carved with their own hands. I'm a potter. I know what it is to make beautiful things. And there is no way to confuse that with anything like a God. How foolish, how ridiculous those Israelites are. Can you hear how I distance myself from those foolish Israelites? That would be a mistake. Who am I to think I would do better? Scripture is very clear that the Israelites aren't any more or less righteous on their own than any other people. They're just regular folk like the rest of us. I cannot claim I would do better. The doom and gloom that Zephaniah says is coming for them would be coming for me too. It is a deeply sobering thought. But wait, we've only made it through chapter 3, verse 8 in our summary. And here is our first Jesus encounter. We're coming to it right here, the glorious ending. There is a pattern that a number of the prophets used which set up a long explanation of judgment, but finishes with a way to bring peace and blessing back to the people. So let's read this part together. It is so wonderful, starting at 3.9. Then 
I will purify the lips of the peoples that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder from beyond the rivers of Cush. My worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. On that day, you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble, the remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm on that day. They will say to Jerusalem, do not fear Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves, he will take great delight in you in his love. He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and a reproach for you at that time. I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Do you hear it? First, we are in there. Gentile inclusion. I will change the speech of the peoples. That all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people. And if the Gentiles are in there, Jesus is in there because Jesus is the vine that we are grafted into. Jesus is how the Gentiles get included. Let me give that a little more real estate. Here's another passage from Zechariah, who's a prophet that comes a few generations later after the return from the exile. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, 10 people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we've heard that the Lord God is with you. There's a principle at work here. I like to describe it as if all the epics of redemptive history are drawn as pictures on transparency sheets for those of us who are over 40. For those of us who are under 40, <laughs> they're drawn on layers in Illustrator or some other design program. <laughs> the prophet, as he hears from God, is granted the opportunity to pry the layers apart and see through them toward where God is bringing his people. But it's difficult, or perhaps God wants the prophet to see them this way, for the prophet to parse out which pieces of the image are on which layer. So they get squished into one reality, as if it's all coming at once. We know that the intervening years don't work this way, that the events are actually spread out in time. But that doesn't mean the prophet's exaggerating. It means he sees right past us. Here's how that works in this passage. Do you hear how the text goes well beyond what will be the real experience when it begins to talk about how God will bless his people after they are cleansed or disciplined? We know that the nation of Israel doesn't ever actually experience this in such grand terms, but doesn't this sound like the crowds that follow Jesus around? And doesn't it sound more like what happens at Pentecost? And if you think about it, don't the descriptions of heaven elsewhere in scripture sound like the real outcome? To be sure, the results of what Zephaniah and Zechariah are talking about are happening because some people do come back with them from exile. 
But this picture gets reworked and expanded again and again and again until it reaches its fullness long after the time of these prophets. Always this is in terms that are greater than reality. This is why I call these the glorious endings. It's not that the Bible is trying to make it sound better than it is. It's because the prophet is looking into the future and he is seeing the glorious ending. And Jesus, of course, can be found in that glorious ending. Indeed, we can find him well before the end as the cycle repeats and expands. There's another bit of Jesus we can find in this section, which comes up all over the prophets and the Old Testament. It's the idea of the remnant. Zephaniah describes this remnant as having pure speech, being meek, humble, trusting in the name of the Lord. All of these things will become true of us when we are recreated in the presence of the Lord in heaven. However, there is one of whom all of these things are already true. Who does this describe already? The Lord's anointed, Jesus. He always goes before us. The nation of Israel is essentially reduced to one, to a true son, and through him we are all reborn into the new kingdom of the Son of God. Okay, let's find Jesus another way. Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3. Gather together. Gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the decree takes effect and that day passes like windblown chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. You who do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility, perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Anyone want to pick out the troublesome word there? Perhaps? What do you mean, perhaps? There's no perhaps in salvation. That's a real problem for New Testament readers, isn't it? I bet it was a problem for Zephaniah's people, too. What about all those verses in Psalms about God being our strong tower? An ever-present help in trouble. What, we're just not doing that anymore? It can be hard to hear this as the original audience might have heard it. To be honest, I don't know how confusing this would have been for them. Maybe God really was starting to shake their foundations. Maybe he was saying to them, wake up! Repent! You cannot imagine the horrors you will witness if you don't turn back to me. Because remember the timeline these people are on. In one generation, the siege of Jerusalem, which is the context of Lamentations, will occur. But praise the Lord, we are New Testament readers. And what do we do with this little word, perhaps? when we look through the redemptive lens of the finished work of Christ? Oh, my sisters, answer this question. How am I hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord? What is your answer? In Jesus, in Jesus, in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we just live in that for a minute? There is no more, perhaps. Remember, Luke gathered up his gospel to make an orderly account for the one who loves God. Is that you? Praise Jesus. God, John wrote his gospel so that those who do not see him may believe. Do you believe? Amen. Zephaniah is written for us to know that God has been saving his people all along. We have been moving toward Christ it was for them to believe that the Messiah was coming, that God had not abandoned them, that he alone is the one true God. It is for us to believe that Jesus has come and will yet come again, that he is the full expression of the one true God, that he has not abandoned us. The work of believing is different in different eras, but I would hesitate to say it is easier or harder in one era or another. It is a work. 
because it causes us to go against our bent toward our own sin. That is a constant in the human condition. And God has made a way in every time to know him. Redemption has always been his plan. He has always been doing it. He has not been waiting. He has been redeeming all along. Last one. How do we see Jesus in the doom and gloom? Most of this book is doom and gloom. And as you may be able to tell from the doom and gloom reference, this one can be a little emotionally wrenching. Remember Lamentations? Do you remember that we need to read the prophets in light of the whole story? So the worst possible thing for an Israelite is coming. Soon. Let's step back just a bit. Turn to the left a few pages to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk is a, relatively con a relative contemporary to Zephaniah. Habakkuk has been wondering how long God is going to allow his own people to be so awful. And God has a surprising answer for him. Soon he's going to use the Babylonians to discipline his people. He says about Babylon, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. He will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it is your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. God is calling out Babylon for being horrible to their neighbors, and they were. You know, they were the ones who held Jerusalem under siege that caused the context for the book of Lamentations. They were awful, and Habakkuk knew this. He was rightly appalled. God was going to send the Babylonians, the Babylonians, to deal with Judah's sin. Someone even worse than Judah. Even worse. Just to finish this thought from Habakkuk, God, knowing that Habakkuk is confused, has a word for Babylon as well. He says, once I have used you as a judgment for my people, the cup that you have so callously been making everyone around you drink, I will make you, Babylon, finally drink it. God cannot be thwarted. He cannot be overcome, not even by the mightiest of nations. This judgment from God that is coming at the hand of the Babylonians is the doom and gloom that is coming, that Zephaniah is warning the people about. This is it exactly. Babylon is coming with their cup of wrath that they are making all their neighbors drink. And it will be bad. It will feel like the world is coming apart. So bad you will wish you had not been born and that your children had not been born. Is that image familiar? A cup. Can you think of another cup? Listen to these words from John. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. This is the cup in the Lord's right hand, the cup of wrath. Paul makes it clear in Romans 5 that we were all enemies of God. And God indeed has a cup of wrath for his enemies. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus went through lamentations for me. He knew what it would be. He went anyway. My cup is empty. Jesus drank it. Can you see Jesus in the doom and gloom? He is in every speck of it. Every shred of it. Praise the Lord. We found some 
though certainly not all, of the ways to find Jesus in Zephaniah. He was in the Gentile inclusion and the glorious ending. He was in the remnant of the one true Son and in the finished work of our salvation. And Jesus took our cup and drank it dry. This is the one we worship. He will wipe away every tear. He bears our scars. He will make all things new. He has made all things new. He sits even now at the right hand of God the Father. You know that in heaven, we will see him face to face. We will know him as we are fully known. You know that in heaven, we will experience his glory and not be consumed by it. You know that we who believe are indwelt right now by the Holy Spirit. What? That is mind-blowing. What the prophets wouldn't give to know what we know. So engage with the God of the Bible on his own terms. Let him tell you all of his story. He won't overwhelm you. It is so very worth it. He is so very worth it. He is worth knowing. It is worth all the effort you may ever put into knowing him. He is there to be found and he will reveal himself.